Can a country really enforce a space treaty? And so do they make any sense? What's a better future, colonies on Mars or on a giant rotating spaceship? What's India's space program been up to lately? And in Q&A Plus, would I take a one-way ticket to Mars? Answering all these questions and more in this question show. Time for the question show. Your questions, my answers, as always, wherever you are, across my channel. If a question pops in your brain, just write it down. I'll gather them up and I will answer them here. All right, let's get into the questions. I am sick. Would you rather live on Mars or in a rotating habitat? Personally, me, neither. I'd like to live on Earth. But if I had to choose, if you're going to destroy Earth, and then I had to choose whether I was going to live in a rotating habitat or I was going to live on Mars, I would probably choose the rotating habitat. And the reason for that is probably just because we can guarantee that we can produce artificial gravity with this giant rotating habitat. And we just we don't know what the effects of low gravity are going to be on the human body. So if you go and live on Mars, and you're living on one third gravity for years and years and years on end, we don't know what the cumulative health effects are for that experience could be that it's fine. And that living on Mars is just like living on Earth. But it could be that it is bad for your body. And it shortens your lifespan and gives you all kinds of health issues a couple of years into this process. And so then what are the methods to mitigate that you're going to have to live on some kind of gravity train on Mars that is driving in this big circle, and you're pretty much on a rotating space station anyway. But living on Mars, you do have regular you have dirt, right that you can dig around in you can walk around out on the surface, you can explore a vast landscape if you're living in a now I'm changing my mind. If you're living on a rotating space station, then then you're kind of limited to just the space station. It depends on how big it is, right? If you make it really, really big and really, really fun and really cool, that'd be all right. Um, so I, you know, I, neither Earth, please. Busy Billy B33. How enforceable is the Outer Space Treaty? If a nation goes out to mine resources, what do the others do? I mean, the Outer Space Treaty is an international treaty that is enforceable as various other international treaties are. Some of them are very heavily enforced, and others are very loosely enforced, and people violate them all the time. Now, the Outer Space Treaty really mostly is about the prevention of nuclear weapons being deployed in space. And so it would be devastating if you allowed people to just launch nuclear weapons into space and have them orbiting overhead all the time that right now, you know, if two nations want to go to war with each other with nuclear weapons, they need to fire their ballistic missiles, and those missiles need to take 45 minutes to arrive at their destination. And you've got 40, you've got minutes of warning where you can launch a counter strike. And so you're locked in this nuclear stalemate. But if you were able to put nuclear weapons into satellites and have them fly overhead, then when your nuclear satellites were flying over your enemy nation, you just launch the rocket down, and it detonates a minute later, two minutes later, like it doesn't take long to go from low Earth orbit to detonating above the city of your choice. And you can imagine there would always be nuclear powered platforms, nuclear weapon platforms just floating overhead at all times, and there would be no stalemate. And so the really the key of the Outer Space Treaty, the purpose was to limit the ability for nations to put these nuclear weapons into orbital platforms and have them hanging over top of each other. And that went through. And so like, how enforceable is the Outer Space Treaty? Nobody has dared launch nuclear weapons platforms into space and have them hanging over their potential enemies. Uh, if they if anybody did, they would suffer immediate and severe consequences. Would they suffer a nuclear they would probably suffer a conventional weapons hot war if they tried to do it right. If one nation tried to launch a nuclear weapons platform that went overhead their enemy nation they would at the very least fall under the entire sanctions of planet Earth. That would be the best case scenario. And the worst case scenario, they would instantly be invaded by all of their enemies. And anybody who was sitting neutral on the fence would take a dim view as well. Because 
people shouldn't be allowed to start nuclear wars with two minutes notice. We need to have the 45 minutes notice that keeps us all safe from the nuclear Armageddon. Uh, and so really, you know, then there's a bunch of other stuff like you can't own parts of space and here are the rules if you you know, on how you have to be able to allow people to to hang out in your colony on Mars and so on and so forth. But really, it's about no nukes in space. So how enforceable? Um, you know, if a nation tries to go out and mine resources, it's not really covered by the Outer Space Treaty. When you think about it, the Japanese Hayabusa 2 mission and NASA's OSIRIS-REx mission have mined resources from asteroids and brought them back to Earth. Now, it's measured in the grams, but it happened, and nobody is considering that to be a violation of the Outer Space Treaty. And if they brought back tens of kilograms, hundreds of kilograms, thousands of kilograms, like at a certain point, someone's going to go, wait a minute, what are you doing here? Um, but I, I don't think it's going to be a big, it won't be a big issue to have nations agree to certain reasonable space based in situ resource utilization uh, into the future. Tarun Pilikanti, India is building its capabilities to construct a space station. What are your thoughts? I think that's great. I think the more nations that are capable of building uh, structures in space is better. The ISRO is a fascinating group, and they're very effective in producing spacecraft. Like the engineering capability of the people at ISRO is world class. With their mom mission to Mars, they sent a spacecraft to Mars for a fraction of the price that it cost other nations, just a few hundred million dollars. And even sort of when you consider wages in India compared to wages in other countries, it's still done on a cheaper budget than than other countries are capable of. There's a lot of really great engineering. India built the Chandrayaan probe. This was the spacecraft that discovered the presence of water at the moon's poles. And so uh, they're going to be attempting another landing on the surface of the moon. They're planning now on building their own human space exploration technology capability in the same way that the Chinese did. And so so first, you build an orbital capsule, a rocket capable of carrying an orbital capsule into low Earth orbit, and you have astronauts go on board. Then you build a space station where the capsules will dock with it. And it is planning on sending people to the moon, um, probably within the next decade as well. So there are many more nations now that are capable of doing long duration spaceflight. I mean, it's not just NASA, Russia, the Chinese now, um, as well as uh, India is going to be coming up quickly as well, you know, and then other nations participate. I mean, the, the Japanese, the Canadians, um, various European nations contribute astronauts and funds to the work done by other nations. So uh, more and more we're seeing as the costs come down for spaceflight, more and more nations are capable of sort of stepping up and being able to start deploying into space. It's time to shout out our new patrons at the $5 level and above. Ryan C91, Benjamin Valamort, Lukash Wegelchek, Sandy, Stephen Brown, Stephen Thomas, Tom Dixon, Steve Nichols, Stefan Berthold, and Daniel. Join our community at patreon.com slash universe today. Dougal, how difficult is it to see the Orion Nebula? Not hard at all. Uh, the Orion Nebula is very bright. So where I live in Canada, I have Bortal 2 skies. So not the absolute darkest skies, but they're one step away from the darkest skies. And I can walk outside. I can look in the direction of Orion when there's no moon in the sky and I can see the Orion Nebula with my eyes. Now, it's, it's this little fuzzy, hazy patch uh, in Orion's scabbard, but it's definitely there. And then when you look at it in a small pair of binoculars, you can see the area where the Orion Nebula is. And when you look at a small telescope, it looks even better. And then obviously, when you take a longer exposure photograph, then it looks phenomenal. So uh, yeah, yeah, it's easy to see the Orion Nebula. When I'm doing the virtual star parties with the telescope, and Orion is up, then it just is an overwhelmingly beautiful nebula compared to anything else you can take a picture of. It's so big and so bright um, with so much material, so much going on in the Orion Nebula compared to you know, everything else. It's like little fuzzy bits or you have to do really long exposures to get some of the fainter nebulosity. But Orion is big, bright, 
very short exposures do incredible justice to that to that nebula and it just shows you can see it i mean there's there's a bunch of stuff that i think people are surprised that you can see with your eyes like you walk outside you can see the pleiades star cluster very easily in fact they used to in theory I've heard this, that they use it as an eye test. So how many stars can you see in Pleiades will tell you how good your eyesight is. You can see Andromeda, the Andromeda galaxy. It's, you know, once you know where to look, it's this little fuzzy spot in the sky. You can see M33, which is the other galaxy that's part of the local group. You can see the large and small Magellanic clouds. Uh, so there's a lot of objects you can actually see with the unaided eye. Just when you walk outside, a lot of star clusters I can see with my eyes. Larry Tilgamon. Why can't we leave our solar system the way Oumuamua came in? Oumuamua is on a hyperbolic trajectory that's going to carry it through the solar system back into interstellar space. It has not been captured by the solar system. And in fact, we have sent spacecraft on escape trajectories from the solar system. So the Pioneer spacecraft, the Voyagers, and the New Horizons mission are all on velocities that are so high, they're going to leave the orbit of the sun and they're going to go into orbit around the Milky Way. And if you wanted to send a spacecraft from Earth and you wanted to be able to achieve that, that velocity, you just need about 12 and a half kilometers per second in escape velocity once you've already once you're already in space. So it takes you about seven and a half kilometers per second of delta V to get off of the surface of planet Earth. And once you're in orbit around planet Earth, it takes about another 12 and a half kilometers per second of delta V of velocity to be able to leave the solar system. And the best way to do that is to use gravitational assist that you can add a few kilometers per second to the speed of your spacecraft by doing gravitational assists of Jupiter and Saturn, Neptune, Uranus. Um, and that's why Voyager 2 is going so fast and Voyager 1 is going even faster. Um, but because they were able to do these really good gravitational assists, same thing with New Horizons. So uh, yeah, we've already sent five spacecraft on a trajectory that's going to leave the solar system. GTP vexed. For those of us who don't understand, can you please explain what a light year is and why we calculate distances using them? Sure, a light year is just the distance that light travels in one year. So light travels at 299,900, like just shy of 300,000 kilometers per second. And if you stretch that out to an entire year, it is a vast amount of time. So like why do astronomers use that? Just because light is the fastest possible moving thing and light moves very far and the distances in space are enormous. And so it's only thinking about in terms of light years, thousands of light years, millions of light years, billions of light years that you can start to really wrap your head around the vast scale of the universe. But actually, astronomers don't use the term light year. That is a thing that we regular people use in the common parlance. But astronomers use a more obscure term um, called a parsec. And a parsec, <laughs> I'm trying to explain a parsec. A parsec is about three light years. <laughs> So that's the simple answer. But essentially, it's based on trigonometry, the Earth's position on two sides of the sun and the triangle that it makes and the amount of degrees in arcs, seconds that move across the sky. They use that to measure It's called a parsec. And then they measure thousands of parsecs, millions of parsecs. And but roughly when you hear that something is one parsec in your mind, you should just go, that's about three light years. And that's what I do. Did you know that you can watch the same video with no ads and get a bonus question over on Patreon completely for free? We call it Q&A Plus. And this week's bonus question is all about going on a one-way trip to Mars. Would I do it? I'll put a link in the show notes. All right, those are all the questions that we had this week. Thank you, everybody, for hanging out and uh, asking your questions in the YouTube comments, as well as everybody who answered questions in the live shows that we did over the course of the year. I'm going to talk about a book series that I'm reading. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Andrew Gross, Bradley Griffin, Brian Bodie, Kerwin, Chuck Hawkins, Commander Baylock, Cy Nelson, David Gilton, and David Matz, Dustin Cable, Evan Pro, Greg Feely, Hudson Ward, James Clark, Jeremy Matter, and Jim Burke, Dorian Young, Marcel Spitz, Michael Purcell, Modzo, Paul Robach, Ren Kaidu, Robeck, Sean Sargent, Stephen Fyler Munley, Vlad Shippelin, and Wolfgang Klotz, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all our patrons. All your support means the universe to us. 
So I just wanted to give you an update on uh, books that I'm reading right now right, during the summer hiatus. So I'm reading a book series called Dungeon Crawler Carl, and this was a recommendation from my son. And they're great. They're very much in the sort of same vein as We Are Legion, I Am Bob, uh, The Martian, Andy Weir books, you know, very lighthearted, but very, very creative. And the gist of the story is it's about a guy who uh, and his cat who are uh, the world ends and they are sucked into a uh, sort of alien blood sport video game and have to descend down through this dungeon level after level. And it is a like it's a totally a trope in uh, especially like Chinese uh, web fiction, but also Japanese stuff when you think about, say, and Korean Squid Game or uh, uh, Alice in Borderlands. But the book is very well written. Uh, the it's sort of the first book is like the weakest, in my opinion, and they get stronger and stronger over time as the ideas get more fleshed out. And what feels very formulaic very quickly kind of goes off the rails in a very good way and sort of showing you a much larger picture of what's going on. But, um, you know, if you're looking for something that's very light, very digestible and also wildly entertaining, I highly recommend uh, Dungeon Crawler Carl. So check that out. All right. We'll see you next time.